Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of both the Miller Center and the University of Virginia Press, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm thrilled to be introducing today's event because it represents the culmination of a center-wide research project that began in 2017 and was led by our presidential studies team, in particular, Barbara Perry and Sid Milkis. But it really came to include all of our full faculty and fellows, all of our staff, and our governing council, as I'll explain in a minute. This project was motivated by an attempt to answer the following question. How can a president, how can American presidents lead the nation in an era of polarization and dysfunction? In the end, this query led to an expansive agenda that produced actionable advice around three main subject areas, the presidency and the constitution, the presidency and policy, and the presidency and the American people. I'll pause here for a brief video that we produced a few years ago to give you a better sense of the project's aim and scope. The American presidency stands at a crossroads. Presidents must lead a diverse nation, navigate a partisan landscape, work with a divided Congress. I'll be happy to, but you, you need to make sure the entire record is yeah, correct, and Mr. That's what, and that's exactly what I want to do. Well, then go that's ahead. I'm about to tell you. Manage world tensions, communicate through new and traditional media. To anger people like you. Okay. Yes, one more question. And unify a nation divided. Fortunately, Americans do not have just one president. We have had 45 administrations to learn from, each with a record of victories and defeats. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. From this one office come critical decisions that affect countless lives around the world. And shape the course of history. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. For more than 40 years, the University of Virginia's Miller Center has focused on the serious responsibilities of the presidency. Based at a university founded by presidents Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, we connect the lessons of history to today's leadership challenges. Now we are embarking on an ambitious research agenda to study the modern presidency, from constitutional powers to policy challenges to how the office represents the American people. How can 21st century presidents lead a system designed almost 250 years ago? How does a president decide when to go to war, administer justice, or take our economy forward? How can a president bring together a country often divided by region, race, and religion? We publish books, essays, and policy papers. We sponsor conferences and seminars and produce videos and documentaries. We use traditional and new media, and we speak directly to policymakers. Our experts in politics, law, history, and business work together with an unmatched network of former White House officials from both parties, and we engage with concerned citizens from across the country to lead our democracy forward. Together we frame and influence public debate through discovery and dialogue, not dogma or discord. We reveal what really happened behind closed doors in the presidencies of John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and Richard Nixon through our curation and analysis of the secret White House tapes. I want it implemented on a thievery basis. Got to get in and get those files. All the same, get it. And our comprehensive oral histories for Presidents Carter, Reagan, Bush 41, Clinton, and Bush 43 capture critical memories and uncover new perspectives on historic events. One of the real problems you have with any new administration, even one as experienced as ours was, is we weren't a bunch of amateurs. We'd been around there before. The Miller Center brings the lessons of history to life and connects the past to the future.
We produced that video when we first announced this undertaking in February of 2018. And today's conversation focuses on, on the first and perhaps the most critical subject in this series, a new book called The Presidency Facing Constitutional Crossroads, which has also just been pu published by the University of Virginia Press. This volume has some of America's leading students of the presidency contributing, including our own Sid Milkis, Joseph Ellis, Sai Prakash, Andrew Rudolevich. And we're fortunate to have the co-editors of the book as well as two additional authors with us to discuss it today. Barbara Perry, as many of you know, serves as the Gerald R. Belisles Professor and Director of Presidential Studies here at the Miller Center, where she also co-directs the Presidential Oral History Program. She's authored or edited 16 books on presidents, first ladies, the Kennedy family, the Supreme Court and civil rights. She and Stephanie Georgiakis Abbott, also here at the Miller Center, have a terrific essay in the book on the personal presidency. And we are thrilled she's going to not just join the conversation, but lead it as our moderator today. Mike Nelson is also a familiar face to our Miller Center audiences. He co-edited this book with Barbara and serves as the former professor of political science at Rhodes College and as a senior fellow here at the Miller Center. He's published mul multiple books on the presidency, including the leading textbook, The American Presidency, which he co-authored with Sid Milkis. His essay in this volume is on 10 ways that different presidents have amended the informal constitution that undergirds the formal constitution. Mike, many thanks for being with us and for the terrific essay and the co-editing of the book. Russell Riley, also known to many of you, also serves as the co-chair of the oral history program with Barbara and as the White Burkett Miller Center Professor of Ethics and Institutions. He's one of the nation's foremost authorities on elite oral history, history interviewing. And he joins us to discuss his chapter on post-war presidency and why Americans like to get rid of them. Finally, a welcome to Sean Theriault, who contributed a chapter on presidents and congressional gridlock, which he co-wrote with UVA's Jennifer Lawless, who's also a Miller Center senior fellow. Sean is a professor in the Department of Government at the University of Texas at Austin. He's fascinated by congress congressional decision-making and has written numerous books on the subject. As with the other chapters featured today, it is a fascinating and fun read. It also has the virtue of being true. Before I turn it over to Barbara, I do want to thank the Miller Center Governing Council for their intellectual contrib contributions and support in this undertaking. When we first broached this topic with them back in 2017, they dove into a series of breakout sessions, helping us refine and lift up this undertaking. These topics were the intellectual backbone of our Presidential Ideas Festival, and they continue to guide a lot of our public programming. So I really want to thank them for helping shape this undertaking. And finally, I want to thank our partners at the UVA Press, including especially Suzanne Muma, who will help us close today's event. We're excited to have this as the first in a series of books on the presidency. And to our own event team and AV team that pulls these events together, especially Christina lopez Guitardi chow And finally, to you, our audience, who we really want to include in the conversation. So get your questions ready. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Barbara. Barbara, congratulations on the book. The chapter and thanks for taking this on. Well, thank you, Bill, for joining us today. And as the acknowledgments say right up front in this book, uh, the topic and the whole concept of the presidency at a crossroads wouldn't exist without uh, Bill's leadership and inspiration. And I can easily say that the book itself would not exist if not for my senior colleague and very much the senior editor uh, on this book, Mike Nelson. So thanks to both of them. And also we should thank the Miller Center team for that great video uh, on the concept of presidency at a crossroads, Woody Sherman and Mike Greco and uh, our board member, uh, Ann Compton for her great narration. I still get chills every time I, I watch that video. So thanks to all of them for putting that together. Uh, so with that, uh, let me also uh, say what, what Bill, re to repeat what he said, if you have questions, you don't have to wait until the end uh, of this hour. You can start to submit them uh, in the Q&A function. And as we can, we will try to sprinkle them in uh, among our presentations today. Uh, 
let me turn now to my colleague, Mike Nelson, and uh, ask if he has anything to add to uh, Bill's introductory remarks about the overview of this book, uh, having spent so much time with the topic. Uh, and after that, uh, Mike, to give us a little bit of an overview of your chapter on turning points uh, in the crossroads of the presidency over its history. Thanks, Barbara. And, uh, and when Barbara says that I did most of the work, um, she is being more, more than kind, more, too kind. Um, the, the crossroads concept turned out to be a really useful one. And if you think about in ordinary life coming to a crossroads, you've got to make some sort of decision about which way to turn. And if you come back to that crossroads at another time, you may make a, a, a decision to take a different turn. And this turned out to be a very useful animating theme in the book. Uh, my focus was on um, crossroads that are not constitutional in the sense of the capital C constitution, the actual document, but rather constitutional in the sense of the small C constitution, the sort of, in many cases, unwritten rules of the game that, that had to be written and, and sometimes rewritten because of ambiguities in the original document. And if I have time, I'll mention three Virginia presidents just to be in the spirit of, of things here. Starting with George Washington, you know, when, when George Washington became president, he said he was walking on untrodden ground. And of course he used the constitution as a guide to the extent possible, but the constitution didn't answer every question that he had to face as the first president. For example, constitution is very detailed in describing how the, the process of vetoing a bill works. It gives no guidance at all about when it is appropriate to cast a veto. In Washington's judgment call, and that's what it was, he felt that a president should only veto a bill if he thought it was unconstitutional. That otherwise, the president should defer to Congress as the legislative branch. And his five uh, immediate successors for 40 years, the first 40 years under the presidency, pretty much followed in that path. But that crossroads was visited, visited again under Andrew Jackson, who basically looked at the constitution and says, there's nothing in here that tells me to limit my use of the veto power only to, to legislation that I think is unconstitutional. If I think it's a bad bill, like the bank, the national bank renewal, I'm gonna veto it and, and we'll let the people decide whether I've made the right judgment call or not. And of course, that's the practice that has prevailed ever since. Another example from, from Washington and this time Jefferson, nothing in the constitution about what's the appropriate number of terms for a president to serve, at least not until the 22nd Amendment imposed a two-term limit. Washington, as the first president, had to make a judgment call. When is it that, uh, that I should step down? He decided, under his circumstances, longing to be home at Mount Vernon, um, feeling like the Constitution really needed to, to, to be shown to work, even though he was no longer president. Washington made a judgment call that two terms was enough for him. He in no way meant to bind the future. But Thomas Jefferson, who had not been at the Constitutional Convention, who when Madison sent him a copy of the document in Paris, read it and said, what's this about no term limit on the president? Jefferson sort of became president with the idea that there should be some sort of unwritten rule. And, and, and when asked to, by some state legislatures to, to run for a third term, Jefferson said, well, you know, that's that the illustrious Washington has set the precedent in these matters and, and no one should try to serve more than two terms. Washington didn't mean that at all, but it became sort of the unwritten rule until FDR broke it. And then it became a written rule with the 22nd Amendment. And I'll mention one more Virginia president who came to a crossroads and made a decision about which way to go that was sort of new and different. And that was Woodrow Wilson. Wilson uh, became president in, in 1913. And, and up to that time, with the partial exception of Theodore Roosevelt, up to that time, the unwritten rule about presidential rhetoric, about presidential presidents speaking to the American people, the unwritten rule was presidents don't do that except on formal occasions, an inauguration, uh, the dedication of a national cemetery at Gettysburg, but the idea of a president going out and making speeches to rouse public support on behalf of, of a legislative agenda and put pressure on Congress by doing so, that, was, that violated the sort of unwritten rules 
of, of the game. And the Constitution itself provided no guidance there. Wilson said, I think the American people want to hear from me. And if Congress isn't reacting in the way I wish it would to my agenda, I'm going to go to the people and, and, and ask them to basically tell members of Congress, support the president. Well, it worked a good bit of the time. It didn't work in the case of getting the Versailles Treaty ratified. My point here is that, that filling in the blanks in the Constitution, what is not written, um, is something that presidents sometimes have to do. And in, in the case of Washington, Jefferson, and Wilson, we saw efforts to do that, some of which took, some of which were undone by subsequent presidents. At the end of the day, the test of a presidential innovation, of a president's decision at the crossroads which way to go, at the end of the day, the test is whether the rest of the political system, including the American people, acknowledge that a change that has taken place has taken place for the better. So I'll just wrap things up there. I wanna hear from my colleagues as much as, uh, as, as, as the audience does. All right, Mike, thanks so much. I, I'm gonna turn to my colleague, Russell Riley now. And as Bill indicated, uh, Russell is going to talk about a, a fascinating topic that is uh, focus of his on, in this chapter for this book, uh, and that at some point, uh, Russell will produce, we think, a, an entire book on this very <laughs> subject. And I think it has the best title ever of a chapter or a someday forthcoming book, American Regicide, he calls it. And it is about the fact that presidents, of course, take on a lot of powers, uh, oftentimes uh, extra constitutionally during war, but that Russell has discovered a pattern that after the war, uh, the people People are not so willing to give over power to presidents. Uh, so with that as an introduction, Russell, take it away. Sure. Thanks, Barbara. I'm assuming everybody can hear me and we're not, we're not confronting one of those problems uh, that I had before. Th okay, terrific. Um, and and uh, thanks to both Barbara and Mike for doing a splendid job uh, with the book. It is always a great pleasure uh, working with them and to have an excuse to, uh, to do another book was uh, uh, quite a... Um, uh, uh, quite a, a, a great thing, I think, for the for the center. One of the recur as Barbara indicated, one of the recurring crossroads uh, that every political system will occasionally confront relates to war or national security crisis. Um, people who have examined political systems will look at democratic republics, and while they are really good at doing certain things in terms of representation and so forth. They tend not to be very good at uh, waging war. And the thinking on this goes back at least as far as Locke and his studies of prerogative power. And so uh, when wars come, a, a crossroads is encountered about whether you continue to do business as usual or you try something different. Uh, in some political systems, there is a formal provision for a kind of emergency government. For example, in France, uh, in the Constitution of the Fifth Republic, there's a completely alternate way of governing under uh, executive authority in times of emergency. The United States Constitution doesn't have something like that. If you go looking for the war power in the American Constitution, you pick up bits and pieces of it uh, in various places. And so um, what we have uh, in the American system is not a formal provision for an alternate way of governing in times of war, but instead a kind of informal behavioral approach in which Americans act differently uh, in their political systems than they do under normal circumstances. And the history of this is well known to pretty much anybody who pays much attention to American history, right? I mean, if you think about when the major exercises of presidential power have occurred, uh, they tend to be during wartime. And the, the most prominent examples, most prominent three examples for us, uh, first with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln at the outset of the Civil War uh, uh, institutes a blockade on Southern ports. He starts spending money and raising troops, which clearly are uh, 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 constitutionally uh, provisions uh, intended to be legislative powers. Uh, he does these things without calling Congress back into session for, um, uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks and uh, gets away with it, uh, eventually asks Congress to authorize this, which they do. Uh, 
Later in the war, through the Emancipation Proclamation, he does what uh, the historians Charles and Mary Beard call the most stupendous act of sequestration in the history of Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence. That's a mouthful. I love that phrase. Uh, but it indicates the vast scope of Abraham Lincoln's power during the course of the Civil War. Uh, during World War I, uh, 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 Woodrow Wilson was uh, 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 mustering troops and sending them abroad. Uh, had a um, uh, significant authority over the American economy such that he could tell Americans how much sugar they could put in their morning coffee, did all kinds of things that we normally would not consider to be constitutionally authorized by a chief executive, but they were accepted because the American people, having confronted the crossroads of war, believed that this is the way we ought to act in order to deal with the, uh, with the issue at hand. Same thing was true with Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, through uh, his economic powers and uh, uh, his intrusions on civil liberties. Uh, for example, the uh, in, uh, interning of, of uh, Japanese Americans, all of these things are uh, a part of the president's war making powers. And we, we accept that as a necessity of national survival. It is, a, it is a part of our embedded political culture that this is the way we behave during times of emergency and crisis. All of that history is fairly well known. What's not very well understood is that there's a counter narrative to this, which sets in at the moment uh, when the crisis has been met. And most people tend not to think about this. They, if, you, if, you, if you pose the question to them, they would say, well, you know, sure, the president's powers get elevated, but they gradually you know, get diminished, or we sort of turn back to a kind of equable status quo antebellum. When in fact, that's not the case, that some of the most contentious politics in all of American history occur in the immediate aftermath of war. And I'll draw your attention again to the three specific cases that follow up the instances that I've just mentioned. What happens at the end of the Civil War? Well, you've got Andrew Johnson serving and people know that Johnson served uh, a contentious presidency. He was impeached. Uh, some of this related to Johnson's temperament and personality, some of it related to the issues of the day, but equally important to these uh, factors was the fact that Congress was very much intent after the war was over in reasserting their rights to govern, to restoring the powers that they had given up to Lincoln through the course of the war. Even when Lincoln was president, mind you, as he had attempted to deal with in, a, uh, uh, in an advanced way with what post-war uh, policy might look like toward the South, the Congress slapped his hand several times and said, no, that's not for you to decide. We're going to decide that. The, uh, uh, the, the conflict that eventually led to Johnson's impeachment was a conflict over who would make uh, a post, uh, uh, post-war policy, uh, whether we would continue along the track that uh, 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 that uh, not the policy path that Lincoln had uh, had advanced uh, necessarily, but certainly whether if we were going to advance along the track of allowing the president to make those decisions, that was something Congress was not willing to allow. And it comes to a head in the Tenure of Office Act when Johnson fires somebody that Congress doesn't think needs to be fired. Uh, the, the, the history immediately after uh, uh, World War I uh, replicates this. Woodrow Wilson was watching in the fall of 1918. He was nervous because the war was coming to an end at the same time that there was going to be a midterm election. And so in an extraordinary fashion, he tried to nationalize the midterm elections. He went to the American people and made an announcement that if we were going to continue to be respected in the world, that uh, the American people needed to give Wilson a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate once again so that Americans, uh, uh, that the American authority abroad would not come uh, into question. It was a colossal mistake. It blew up in his face. The voters went. They uh, sent Republican opposition uh, control to the House and the Senate. And so uh, Wilson was in a terribly weakened position as he attempted to, uh, to win support for the League of Nations and uh, eventually worked himself into an early grave and in, in, uh, raging against those forces of, of uh, contraction. It's not widely known that the same thing actually happens uh, at the end of World War II. Uh, 
and I'll, I'll forego the, in the interest of time, forego the quotes that I've got in the chapter, but they're very colorful quotes about how terrible the political position of Harry Truman was at that time. It was the same factor of the Congress attempting to reassert itself. There was a major legislative reorganization act in 1946 that was largely an attempt to try to recoup a lot of the political terrain that was ceded over to Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. There was an effort by Congress as there was after the Civil War, as there was after World War I, to try to reclaim their authority. It created terrible burdens for Harry Truman uh, so that he was exceedingly unpopular in 1946. That history tends to be forgotten because the Cold War interrupts. And with the advent of the Cold War, you see once again a sort of updraft in presidential standing as the American people began to perceive that an enduring national security threat is going to require an enduring, uh, 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 an, a, a, a powerful presidency on an enduring basis. And that lasts for something like 40 years. We, you don't see a presidency quite at the Franklin Roosevelt Heights, but there is, uh, during the entire run of the, um, of the Cold War, the president operating in an elevated state because of the national security crisis. I don't have time fully to go into the, uh, 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 to the final uh, component of this, but what I see and what I discuss in the chapter is that you actually see at the end of the Cold War, this same pattern replicate itself. And that's one of the advantages of finding a historical pattern is it sometimes leads you to, to detect uh, behavior in a way that you might not otherwise have seen. It's what I describe in the chapter is how George H.W. Bush's lack of success in running for re-election in 1992 is actually a signature of this post-war contraction in the institution. I do the same thing with Bill Clinton, looking at the failure of his health care um, uh, uh, policy, which was a sort of anachronistic in a post-war environment. Uh, the 1994 midterm election looks very much like 1918. It looks very much like 1946. It looks very much like 1954. Almost never do you just see circumstances where a president loses both chambers of Congress in a single election. You did in 1994. And then in order to sell books, I'll just say one of the things that I do here that I often do with my classes is that I indicate that uh, Monica Lewinsky's blue dress actually, can, uh, the importance of Monica Lewinsky's blue dress actually can be traced to the fall of the Berlin Wall. I'll not describe that here. I'll send the book to you for details. <laughs> And we'll wait for the movie as well, Russell, based on, on the book and certainly on, on your book. I, I can just see American Regicide, the Hollywood uh, movie version. Uh, so thank you, Russell, for that. And if I can mix my metaphors between highways and baseball and before I bat third and then turn to Sean as our cleanup batter, um, before I, I begin, if I can ask the panel to be thinking about how they might answer a question from one of our audience members, Gary Donato, says perhaps you can insert this question sometime after your reaction to the initial panelist's remarks. How does the president, how does the present day political environment compare to such milestones in presidential history as 1800, 1824, or 1987, or the ascendancy of Tyler to the presidency. I, I hope one of my panelists is a, is a Tyler expert. I have to admit that I'm not, though I did at a presidential sites conference uh, now three years ago in Washington, I met John Tyler's grandson uh, who just recently passed away. Uh, he, because John Tyler was married twice and the second time he married a much younger woman, uh, he actually literally had grandchildren who live to this day. Uh, that is my one and only connection to John Tyler as far as I know. So with that, let me talk a, a little bit about the chapter that Stephanie George Gakis Abbott and I did called The Personal Presidency at the Crossroads. And this actually piggybacks on how Mike ended about Woodrow Wilson creating what scholars call the rhetorical presidency and some have even 
called the personal presidency. And particularly the scholar uh, Jeff Toulis from the University of Texas, where uh, Sean is today, um, argues that there have been up to, I would say maybe tw 20 years ago or so, not maybe particularly taking into consideration right now as Stephanie and I do. And we, by the way, apply this both domestically to the American presidency and then Stephanie, who is an international relations scholar, applies it in the comparative context. In Jeff Toulis's uh, book, he argues that the founding fathers in the United States uh, created uh, a formal constitution, as we know, in 1789, with checks on the popular will through the Electoral College, various veto powers, judicial review, and limits on suffrage. And he calls that the first constitutional presidency, so the formal constitution. But then he says, uh, as Mike points out, with this changeover uh, for Woodrow Wilson, who, by the way, was the only PhD political science president, uh, Woodrow Wilson created this rhetorical concept of the presidency uh, where he would, would thereby directly relate to the American people. Uh, through speeches, through his rhetoric. Remember at this time by the 19 teens, technology allows for uh, a much broader use of media, travel, the president can travel around the country more, much more easily and can meet with people directly and speak to them. And so taking that as a jumping off point, uh, thinking of Wilson as establishing this second constitutional presidency or the rhetorical presidency or a personal presidency, you can think of some other crossroads as well in this vein with FDR establishing the first mass media presidency through his use of radio. John Kennedy, the same, uh, using the new medium uh, of his day of television. And then with Ronald Reagan uh, as well, I think reaching the people called the great communicator in part because He's our first celebrity president coming from the Hollywood movie scene. So the question that Stephanie and I raised for ourselves was, have we seen now in the last four years particularly, uh, a third constitutional presidency developing? And this would be one that if we looked at the crossroads or the context that are th those that are changing would be that we have 24 seven media, certainly in television, talk radio, particularly conservative talk radio, obviously social media, the development of social media that lets presidents directly relate to the people and communicate with them without even having to go through the mediating institution of the media. Uh, another celebrity president in, in Donald Trump, uh, a, a reality TV star. And so then my question was, have we created in this time period because of these changes, a demagogic president, a demagogic presidency? Um, universal suffrage that we have now in this country expands the impact of populism, that is uh, the people, and populism, particularly as a movement is very anti-elite. Our mediating institutions, some argue, are failing. Media now is being taken over perhaps by social media. We are the media, you and I. Uh, parties perhaps less powerful. This ability, again, to directly message the people. And the very nature of a demagogue is using this to uh, gin up tensions and old rivalries among the people. This was one of the major fears of the founders by allowing even some popular will to have an impact on creating this republic, uh, would that popular will be uh, prone to demagogues? I'll give you a de definition of a demagogue, a political leader who seeks support by appealing to the desires and prejudices of ordinary people rather than by using rational argument. That's from the Oxford Dictionary. Some may add to that uh, appeals through lies or half truths to the base instincts of the people and again tends to gin up old rivalries, particularly tribal rivalries. It's not as though we have seen this for the first time in the last four years in our country. I can name three famous demagogues of the 20th century, Huey Long, Father Coughlin, and Joe McCarthy, uh, representing the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and both sides of the political spectrum as well. And so we, in this day and age, we like to quote Alexander Hamilton, who said the following. This is in Federalist Paper number one about demagogues and republics. He said, of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics, the greatest number have begun their career by paying an obsequious court to the people, commencing demagogues and ending as tyrants.
So I will leave my portion of the presentation today um, with some questions for our audience and perhaps for our panel as well. Where is the presidency headed at this current crossroads? Has the founders uh, formation of the office been overtaken by the rhetorical presidency and maybe even a demagogic presidency? If not, that is, if the founders formal constitutional structure remains, is it strong enough to withstand modern developments in government, in politics, in media, and among the polity? And finally, if so, that is, if the founders formal process, formal structure in the constitution has been overtaken, can we go back to it? Can we go back to the founders' original plan for the presidency? So with that, let me turn things over to my colleague, Sean, uh, who, as Bill said, along with our colleague, Jen Lawless, has put together a superb chapter on the president and Congress. Thanks, Barbara, for that introduction. And, and, and thank you all for uh, inviting me to participate. First, I, I want to apologize um, because when we had this rehearsal, they told me that this was going to be informal. And so, right, it's been 30 years since I've been back in Virginia. And so informal to me means a shirt like this. Apparently for Mike, it means not wearing a suit coat. Uh, <laughs> plus I think it means not wearing a, a tux or something. So I, I, I appreciate you all indulging in, in my, my, my short sleeves today. Um, so I want to thank the, the Miller Center for putting on this great event. Working with them is like working with a, a whole staff of professionals, which is just great. I want to thank Mike and, and Barbara for inviting uh, Jen and I to participate uh, by writing this chapter. And finally, as Jen has commanded me, and, and any of you who have worked with Jen know that she does these to her co-authors, I have to thank Jen for allowing me to be a part of this project. Um, and lastly, I want to thank the audience. I want to thank you all for showing up uh, and, and listening to a little bit about what we have to say about the presidency these days. Um, it, Jen and I in our chapter took a, uh, a more uh, contemporary approach to how it is we're thinking about the crossroads, especially vis-a-vis -vis Congress and, and the president. And um, so uh, we think that, that when, when, uh, when President Trump took the oath of office, that it, it could have given us a window into perhaps gridlock reducing a little bit in Washington, D.C., perhaps the parties not being as polarized as they were before for a couple of, for a few different reasons. One, as Barbara already mentioned, he was a rea reality TV star, so he didn't have a long history in politics. Uh, secondly, the Republican establishment uh, wasn't particularly thrilled with him. Uh, third, he, he was known as being a transactional person. Uh, he wasn't known necessarily for his ideology as much as he was just trying to uh, give something to get something. Um, and we can say that it was an unusual campaign to say the least. Um, and so maybe an unusual campaign leads to an unusual uh, way of thinking about party polarization. And finally, let's never forget that he wrote The Art of the Deal. If there was someone that was gonna be able to, to seal a deal uh, between Democrats and, and Republicans, uh, perhaps it was gonna be Donald Trump who, who thought a little bit more outside the box. So what we do in our chapter to find out if in fact party polarization or gridlock was reduced is we look at uh, conventional measures for the first couple of years of the Trump uh, administration to find out if party polarization was, was increasing or decreasing. Um, and, and perhaps here it's a little bit helpful to take one step back and how it is that we as political scientists or scholars think about political parties. We normally think of them as operating in uh, three different spheres. So the first sphere in which they operate is parties or organizations. Here we can think of the Democrat National Committee or the National Republican Committee, those organizations that are responsible for putting on political conventions. It, it's, it's their very reason for existing to win elections. And so we can appreciate that the parties or organizations are always gonna be opposed. They're always gonna be polarized. That's just by the very definition of, of the functions that they have to fulfill in, in, in our political system. The second level of, of political parties that we can think about or the second sphere in which they operate are parties in the electorate. So this is the psychological attachment that voters have to political parties. Um, and so we can imagine that those fluctuate over time. Uh, after a war that's particularly popular, we can imagine that the, even people from the other party are supportive of the president. Or in, in, in uh, economic depressing times, we can imagine even the president's own partisans uh, disapprove of the way that the president is doing. So we can think about how it is that the, the people actually think about uh, party polarization in, in, in the other side. And then the last fear that we think about political parties operating in is parties in the government. So this is how elected officials do their job inside legislative bodies. Um, so, right, as I have already alluded to, parties and organizations, they're just always polarized. So the next sphere that Jen and I examined were parties in the electorate. 
And so what we looked at was, first we looked at the presidential vote by partisan identifiers. So were Democrats more likely to support Hillary Clinton in 2016 and were Republicans more likely to support Donald Trump? Um, they were, uh, but it wasn't that different from how, uh, how partisans voted in, in previous elections. So the, the trend increased a little bit, but it didn't increase at a, at a, at a higher rate than it, than it did before. Uh, we looked at approval ratings, both within the president's party, so Republicans in, in their approval of, of Donald Trump. We looked at the out party, right, how Democrats thought about Donald Trump. And then we looked at the difference between how Democrats and Republicans were evaluating the president. And what we find in each of those uh, is that, indeed, Republicans were a little bit more supportive. Democrats were a little bit less supportive. Uh, and the gap was a little bit bigger. But again, if we looked at the historical time trend, across history, it didn't deviate from the trend that we had been seeing before. There wasn't a disjoint in 2017 that indicated that, that Trump was changing the way the, the partisan identifiers were thinking about presidents um, uh, before, before that period. So then thinking about uh, polarization in the government. So again, we looked at a, a number of different conventional measures. Uh, the first one of those is presidential support scores. So how frequently do uh, partisans inside Congress in the House and in the Senate uh, support the president when the president has an initiative that they're all voting on? Uh, the second thing that we look at is party unity scores. So how is it that the Republicans vote on votes where Democrats or Republicans have opposing positions? And, and also how is it that Democrats vote on those particular uh, issues that divide the parties. And then last, we look at a, at a thing called DW nominate. We can just think of these as ideology scores. So literally we plug in every single vote and do, uh, since, since George Washington through uh, Donald Trump, every vote in Congress, and, and a computer spits out and says, all right, so which legislators are most opposed? And then everyone else's gradations along the same scale. And what we find and when we look at these three different measures is that uh, the polarization uh, again, it was slightly more increased than it was during the, the second Obama administration, uh, but it was e exactly uh, in the same trend line as it was uh, going all the way back to Bill Clinton and then through the Bush years and then, of course, the Obama years. And so a little, but not anymore. The increase wasn't any bigger than it was during any of the uh, any of the other previous uh, uh, presidents that we looked at. So. Uh, there are two hunches that we have to the research that we conducted in this chapter. The first one is that if we looked at uh, votes and, and, and data from the third and fourth years, we can't imagine that that, that much had changed than the first couple of years in which we look at. And, and I'm sure any cursory analysis would suggest that that was probably the case. The second thing that I would suggest to you all is that there's nothing that's been done in the first hundred years of the Biden administration that would make us reevaluate our conclusion. So in essence, what, what we decide at the end of the chapter is looking at conventional measures of how Congress and the president relate to one another. We don't see any big trend as a consequence of, of Trump being elected. So as, uh, as social scientists, uh, we can conclude uh, one of two things. So the first thing that we could conclude is that the American political institutions are so institutionalized that they're impervious even to a president Trump. Um, in, in, in the, the institutional settings of these places, the, the historical time, time trends in which they operate are just so rooted uh, that even someone as iconoclastic as President Trump isn't gonna disrupt the trends that we've been seeing now for 40 or 50 years. Now, the second uh, way that we could conclude is that social scientists and congressional scholars like myself were looking at the wrong pieces of data to, find, to try and find a Trump effect. Um, and so with this, I'm, I'm actually gonna share my screen and, and suggest to you perhaps uh, some of the data that, that, that we should be looking at. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that we're having this talk just five or six hours after we see this um, meeting inside the Oval Office. So uh, right here's the top four uh, uh, congressional scholars uh, meeting with the vice president and the president in the Oval Office. So that's the way that things normally done. Perhaps if social scientists or, or congressional scholars instead looked at the number of times that speakers of the House ripped up State of the Union addresses, we knew that there was a Trump effect. Um, or perhaps if we counted the number of times that the Speaker of the House in, in, a, in a meeting not unlike today's meeting um, actually stood up and pointed her finger at the president and told, her to, uh, told him to stop bullying people, perhaps we would find that, again, uh, there was a Trump effect. 
Um, so I'm right, suggesting these to you a little bit with my tongue in my cheek, um, but what I will say is that I'm engaged in an ongoing research project now with one of my former students at the, who's at the University of Kentucky, and we're actually looking at, at, at presidential tweets. Um, so how is it that, that uh, President Trump referred to members of Congress um, during his four years? And then how is it that Joe Biden has referred to members of Congress um, in the first 100 plus days of his administration? I suspect when we look at the tone of those tweets and who he's tweeting about and what he's saying, we once again might find that there was some type of, of Trump effect. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Barbara. Oh, Sean, well, thank you so much. Great, great photos and, and great thoughts about uh, how to look at uh, polarization uh, and perhaps just the context in which uh, we have the president and congressional leadership and members of Congress uh, operating today. So just to, to your last point, let me jump ahead to a second question that's from one of our audience members, because I think it relates to what you said your upcoming research is or your current research. And then we'll, we'll jump back to the first question about comparing now to 1800, 1824, 1887 and John Tyler's presidency. So this question, Sean, comes from um, James Michaels. Uh, and he asks about the role of 21st century communication, social media and the internet on democracy. And he notes that um, this evolution in technology and its effect could not possibly have been envisioned by the framers, uh, particularly as it relates to the Electoral College, for example. But again, since you are now gonna be looking at social media and it's used by Trump and now his successor Biden, I thought maybe this would be perfectly aimed at, at you. Sure, it's interesting because we could think that, right, the landscape in which presidents are operating now is just entirely different because they have the ability to directly communicate to the to their constituents and, 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 and the voters in the country. And that's certainly true. But, but I would suggest that the, the idea of an entirely new form of communication isn't at all new, right? Barbara, you even alluded to this in talking about Woodrow Wilson and the rhetorical president. Just imagine the change that happens with the advent of radio. Right, and then television. Again, entirely new modes of communication that presidents have that we would think would empower them because suddenly their message doesn't need to be mediated in quite the same way. And really what is social media and what is Twitter other than another step in that direction of unfiltered president's ability to communicate? And so, right, in part, right, it's incumbent upon us as scholars, we have to start considering new measures to try and figure out the effects of presidents and the relationships between presidents and the institutions uh, on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. Right. Well, and since this is a little bit a part of, of the chapter that Stephanie and I did, I'll, I'll jump in as well. Um, to that very point about the founders not being able to anticipate modern media, of course, they, they couldn't. They had a lot of foresight. They were very prescient people, uh, especially about human nature. Uh, but I always point to the fact that they were so concerned about the role of the people in this relatively new experiment of a republic, uh, that they imposed the electoral college as a check on the popular will. And yet who could vote at the founding? Only other people like themselves, only white male property owners. So I guess at the very beginning, they didn't even trust themselves, but presumably they realized at some point that suffrage would expand. And they certainly weren't going to be trusting people beyond themselves, I, I presume. Um, and then I would also maybe just draw one distinction, Sean. I always was getting questions at the beginning of the Trump administration from media, from traditional media about his use of Twitter leading up to his election and then as he came into office. And I said, I do think one contrast, despite the fact that people were concerned about FDR and Jack Kennedy using the newer, newest forms of, of media when they came into office. And they were worried that, for example, John Kennedy was doing a couple of live press conferences on primetime TV every, every month. Um, but the difference would be as if they, I think to social media, as if FDR and, and John Kennedy had had hot mics in the Oval Office. And so every time they had a thought, it would just go out over the airwaves. And then let's also remember for Bill Clinton's time, maybe back to, to some of Russell's points about limitations on presidents could come from this mediating institution. I can remember Bill Clinton asking for prime, a prime time slot to do a press conference or a speech and the, the major networks uh, turned him down. And I think this was about the time of the Oklahoma City bombing and people were talking about the shrinking Bill Clinton presidency. And then because of the Oklahoma City bombing, Bill Clinton as consoler in chief sort of came back into 
um, our more uh, obvious public consciousness. Anyway, those, those are my thoughts. Anything, Russell or Mike, to add about the founders and uh, modern media? Well, I'll throw in uh, the media and John Tyler, uh, because <laughs> Tyler was president. Tyler was president when I think the most transformative uh, uh, event in presidential communications occurred, and that was the invention of the telegraph, which nobody uses telegrams anymore. But um, that was invented in 1845. Now think about this. For the first time in human history, because of the telegraph, information could travel faster than it could be physically transported. And so you think about Abraham Lincoln, who was really the first president to figure out how to make use of this new medium. He could give a speech in Gettysburg that was 272 words long that probably most people there couldn't even hear. And he could know that because of the telegraph, that speech would be read by Americans around the country within a day or two in their newspapers. Um, now, Tyler was president, by the way, when the telegraph <laughs> was invented by, by Morris in 1845. I'm thinking maybe the connection here is that at the time Tyler was elected as vice president, he was serving with, at that time, the oldest person who'd ever been elected president, and that was William Henry Harrison, who only lasted for one month before he died. Joe Biden, of course, now is had broken that record, smashed that record uh, for longevity at the time of election. But, to, but it, the Constitution wasn't clear about what was supposed to happen. Harrison was the first president to die in office. And what the, the ambiguity in the Constitution was, does the vice president become president in every sense of the word and serve out whatever's left of the four-year term, which in this case was three years and 11 months, or you could just as easily read the Constitution and say that the intention of the framers, and I think this was the intention of the framers, they just didn't make it clear, that the vice president would serve as a kind of acting president until a special election could be called to choose a new president. Tyler, looking at that ambiguous situation, sitting by the way at home in Williamsburg, Virginia, um, the home of his alma mater, William and Mary, our alma mater, I lived in Tyler Hall as a freshman, um, Tyler, said, okay, um, whoever speaks with the greatest clarity is gonna clear up this ambiguity. He hopped a carriage to Washington, said, the way I see it, I'm the president in every sense of the word and will be for at least the next three years and 11 months, and took an oath of office and, and gave a kind of inaugural address. There was grumbling in Congress, but what were they gonna do? Um, so that ambiguity in the original constitution remained there um, in the language of the document until the 25th Amendment was added in 1967. And among the things the 25th Amendment did was spell out in the language of the document that Tyler was in effect right. That <laughs> when the vice president uh, ascends to the presidency because of a presidential death or resignation or impeachment, becomes president in every sense of the word for whatever is left on the four year term. And a good point too, Mike, we heard a lot about the 25th Amendment in the last year about the possibility of removing a sitting president uh, for an illness or uh, mental problem or disability, uh, something that we had faced with Woodrow Wilson uh, back during the Cold War, the fears of a president being taken out or right after the Kennedy assassination, what if Kennedy hadn't died but had been completely incapacitated by his wounds? Uh, so we certainly heard a lot about that. Um, Russell, any other things to add about these uh, landmark dates of 1800, 1824, 1887? Mike's covered us on Tyler. And then I will just um, point out, of course, we know about 1800 particularly and 1824 for that matter, lots and lots of polarization occurring from the almost the founding of our country. And so we've had a third question that comes in from Sarah Lanford. Um, she says, what can, in quotes, we the people do to reduce polarization or to rebalance presidential power? So for any of us, um, feel free to, to jump in on either of those historical dates or bringing us up to the, to the present time. Let me, I, the only, only comment I would make uh, with respect to the last question, uh, just to kind of put a bow on my presentation, was that one of the reasons why I think that um, what, what I sort of call the regicide story is important is because that counter narrative actually supports the fundamental idea that there are uh, uh, cultural and historical constraints operating on the presidency that are very pronounced in certain circumstances. Uh, 
but uh, it's this kind of knowledge is important for empowering people to think about uh, ways to uh, to rein a presidency in if you feel like it's gotten to be too big, and uh, be, because we tend to, to to embrace so readily the idea that Arthur Schlesinger called of an imperial presidency, that. Um, this counter narrative is is a rich mine of data to look to to figure out how you might go about um, reining in the institution if you feel like it's gotten to be too big. And this this ebb and flow of presidential power, as all of my colleagues will uh, will readily uh, uh, agree, I think, is one of the main storylines of, uh, of of American politics. It's it's never set in stone, it's always changing. Right, um, all right, you are Russell. And I'll just add then back to that original question, certainly about 1800 and then getting up into that Jacksonian period. But, but I often, I do a lot of studying of church and state issues as related to civil rights and liberties and um, particularly Jefferson in that phase. So I've looked quite a bit at that 1800 election uh, in part because uh, Jefferson used that phrase, the wall of separation between church and state uh, in the early part of his uh, new presidency after having defeated for re-election uh, John Adams. And he was being asked by the Danbury Baptist Association of Connecticut uh, to declare a day of fast and thanksgiving to try to overcome the upset of the polarization and the vitriol of the 1800 election between the Federalists and the Jeffersonians or the Democratic Republicans as they were called officially. And he said, no, I, I can't do that because uh, the establishment clause, the First Amendment establishes a wall of separation between church and state. So I look at it as somebody who is interested in First Amendment church state issues. But uh, by the way, uh, Jefferson, things were so vitriolic between the Federalists between Adams and, and Jefferson and the Jeffersonians and the Federalists that uh, because Jefferson by this time was a Unitarian uh, and was called an atheist, an atheist we would, we would call him today. Um, so I would say to those who fear the polarization, Sean's point that it's not any really more polarized at least over contemporary times. And that if you wanna see polarization, go back to the, to the founding. Um, as Sean said, that's sort of the notion of political parties. They're partisan and we can get polarized. I would say uh, to Sarah's question, I would think in terms of someone like Edward Kennedy, for whom we did an oral history, uh, and the fact that when we released that in 2015 uh, at, at an event in Washington uh, in the old Senate caucus room, now called the Kennedy caucus room, uh, that Alan Simpson, the Republic, sort of the craggy old Republican from, uh, from out West said, uh, you know, Teddy and I could go at it hammer and tongs on the floor, but we could also compromise. Uh, he was willing to settle for half a loaf, or a quarter loaf if he could get some of the legislation that he wanted. And so we do see that. Even someone is viewed as highly partisan and vitriolic as Teddy Kennedy. And I think that's maybe what Sarah's referring to and that what people, I think the American people are looking for a bit more than we see today. Um, so I understand we're coming now towards the end and that I do believe that, uh, is it the case that Suzanne Mumaw is going to make a statement to us. Is that correct? It is indeed. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you, Susan, and to uh, as well to Nadine uh, for uh, Zimmerly for uh, putting together this book with Mike and me. We, we couldn't have done it without you all. And we're so thrilled. Well, it was really our honor, the, the whole press's honor to publish the presidency facing constitutional co crossroads. I want to repeat that title for the audience. Um, but I want to give a special thanks to you, uh, Barbara, and also Mike, our panelists, um, Russell and Sean, and also your fellow authors. It, it really is a terrific book. But I also want to thank Bill Antholis and Mark Silverstone, who is the editor of the Miller Center Studies on the Presidency. We just, it's our pleasure to be your partner and work with you. I want to just close with this, though. Um, Sid Milkus wrote in his essay, in his chapter, about the refounding. And as I read this book, I, I kept thinking what a critical context it provides uh, as we consider these crossroads and what they might or how they might lead to a refounding 
in our nation. So we are in your debt, all of you, for producing this really terrific and important book. And finally, I'd just like to say to our audience how much we appreciate your being here. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your week and enjoy reading this fine book. So uh, goodbye and thank you again for coming and thanks to all of you, bye-bye. Thank you, Suzanne. And again, thanks to our audience and all those at the Miller Center who make these forums possible. We so appreciate it. And with that, good evening to everyone.